Okay. So, um, I don't know if you found the reading super difficult or if you could figure it out, but um, it made me think of a lot of things and uh, that are unique to teaching this course in this context. AUW, COVID, a lot of things like that. So, uh, so I, you know, I do have ways that I think I can help you understand it if you didn't get it, get much out of it the first time. But I am going to call on you all and just um, ask you. Uh, I guess. Well, okay, Amal, did you get something out of it? Is there something you wanted to say? Comment about it. Are you there? All right, Ashlyn. Uh, Professor, so one thing I got from the reading, even if I couldn't complete it, it's the thing that I have shared in the last class um, about the uh, understanding that we are getting after, the, the realization that we are getting after uh, going to all the um, classes like, uh, we have talked about the Aristotle's virtue and one of the realizations that we got, it's uh, how, how it enhances or embraces the idea of classism if, if, that the first time we were not being able to understand it because it was something, it was thought as something which helps us to uh, uh, get the complete flourishment or to become a healthy psyche. But once when we are going through the classes and when we started thinking critically and reasoning by ourselves, we could understand that the virtues that he is providing is from his subjective mind or it can have a very, um, uh, uh, you know, like a division which, which, which cannot be applied generally. So in that case, it says there is a division. Uh, and another thing, um, I'm not sure whether it is correct, uh, just popped up in my mind is the idea of um, social social conditioning of the children uh, in itself will be having a division because professor, uh, the people like the parents who are rich or who are in a good position, uh, the way of uh, childhood conditioning will be different from the other people who are kind of poor. So the needs that a rich person will be um, giving to their children or uh, will be conditioning their children will be very difficult from the poor. For example, uh, a child from the poor household will the needs of a child from the poor household will be very different from the needs of a rich one, right? So, for example, uh, in the rich household, they will be told like, okay, you have to attain certain uh, uh, kind of educational qualification or something, but that that need won't be necessarily the same as that of the poor. For the poor, it would be just uh, like, okay, you have to find ways to survive or to help, something like that. So I guess the in childhood conditioning in itself is like, uh, having differences in when this classism comes. So um, I guess there are differences uh, that arises, but when we think, uh, uh, okay, a childhood conditioning is one of the important things for uh, getting, uh, you know, making children into a good individual. But when it comes to individual as a whole, like individual in particular, it differs professor. So I guess, making every virtues or everything in a general terms, thinking it from a very subjective mind is not a good idea. So when we apply things in an individual basis, it can differ as the culture, as we have already discussed, the cultural context in itself is different. And individual as uh, individual itself is different from like a group as a whole. So when we apply all the virtues or all the things that we have studied in, a, in an individual basis, I think it can have differences and it contradicts the idea of uh, general virtue system, I guess, Professor. That's what I got. Okay, okay. good. Um, is there some is there some common ground? Also, would be the next question, right? So, you know, we went through Benedict, moral relativism, right? And then we went through slavery and all the ways it's so perverted, right? That it's against nature. So. As you're, as you're going through these virtues, can you correct for the sexism or the classism or the cultural superiority complex, right? 
can you take this the you know the concept of courage and just say yeah not that that has that kind of bias right mm -hmm. and just try to find find the the thing that doesn't change in the midst of the things that do change and also for example the way that you exhibit courage in your life is probably very different from your grandmother's because you're in different situation, right? Uh, but there's still an appropriate kind of response to a fearful situation, whether or not, right? You're male or female, or I mean, so the idea is that you, with your mind, you're constantly trying to find out what's the pattern underneath the appearances, you know, where can we find the something foundational, right? Does that make sense? Yes, Professor, yeah. Okay, and we also are evolving, right? There's a kind of social evolution. So, but again, that's not relativism. So that's what we have to figure out, right? Um, so that's, that's kind of where we're going. Um, all right, so... Aurora. Yes, Professor. I couldn't read actually because I had already slept yesterday. Okay. Um, I do like your papers, Aurora. They're fun to read. Um, is Thanks Chris a lot, Professor. Christina? I think she's here somewhere. All right. Yeah, go ahead, Christina. Professor, I couldn't read it. You didn't read it? Yes, Professor. Okay. Okay. Um, is Asia here yet? Oh, Diana. Did you read it? Okay. Um, is Asia here yet? Um, Falak. Mm, yes, Professor. I read it, but I couldn't understand much. Okay. So later on, um, maybe after I talk for a while, you might be able to chime in, right? It'll remind you of something. Um, is Fardine here? Nope. Um, Fatima. Nope. Um, Isabel. You usually have something to say. Are you there, Isabel? Nope. Uh, Jana Tool. Professor, can you hear me? Yep. Um, I'm sorry. It was uh, unmuted. Mute. Professor, uh, I'm sorry, but I couldn't manage to read last night. Okay. Jana Tool, have you got something? Professor, I'm sorry, I didn't read it. Um, sorry, Professor, you are calling my name? Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, Professor, uh, to be honest, I, uh, yeah, I read the paper. So the first three pages, uh, sorry, the, the first five pages, and then I go from page 15, I read. Uh, and I couldn't finish. I read maybe 20 pages of that uh, at the end. So, Professor, I found it very interesting, but then I found it also easy. It wasn't difficult for me to understand, but then, yeah, I really liked your idea uh, that you talked about Aristotle's and how it is important. We should not like ignore, uh, you know, 
a view only just because you know we are disagree with some points like maybe about the culture points or, or any other point so oh i think like uh yeah aristotle's view of virtue and the human nature and and the human you know reasoning and then it was very important i think uh, we can apply it in our society and it's useful so i really like the example that uh, you brought up uh, from the aristotle thinking like you know how this uh um, human minds are working and everything so they are connected it's not like separate so, I, so if I want to see an object I I, I need inside and, and also light and also you know I, I, I need the real objects so the object is visible because it is meant to be like that right so <clears throat> I like that example and then I also liked uh, uh, when it was uh, uh, there was uh, a paragraph was written about the Greek, Greek uh, speculative thinking or or speculative thinking i think yeah so yeah i i i like that they, how they were thinking and how it improved you know uh, they wanted to create or bring heaven in the earth <laughs> so yeah i also like the that idea a lot and then uh, I liked uh, Aristotle's idea that, you know, human, uh, uh, I mean, virtue is something natural, human uh, by nature seeking uh, to be virtuous. Uh, and then uh, also human by nature want to know. So it's it's not something, you know, uh, ir I mean, not natural. So, I mean, every people like actually do this. So I think I found it, you know, convincing and acceptable. So. Actually, you know, the foundation, we don't have to talk about Aristotle himself. We could just talk about classical humanism. And the main premise is that natural desire to understand things, right? Yeah. And I think that would be gender free, culture free, right? Like this is the stuff from which cultures are made, right? Does that make sense to people? This is sort of we're a certain kind of animal and we have this desire to understand because we can that was actually from an evolutionary point of view the reason why we became so well adapted right is because we could remember right if there was a a, a prey to eat or a predator we were really good we got better and better at experiencing it, remembering it, um, so that we could predict, you know, this is the kind of place that we were in when we found something to eat, or we did or we found an enemy. And then going even further, being able to describe this, right? To, to start being aware that you actually understand this and there's a pattern. And you could start saying things like, okay, if you find bushes, then that's going to, you know, and so we, we worked ourselves way beyond uh, just our memory, just having a memory and just imitating other people in our species, right? And that's given us incredible power, but for good or evil. And um, so that, to me, that's the, you know, that's the foundation, this capacity to understand. And that's not gendered, and that's not race, and that's not class, and that's not ethnicity or culture or anything. But it all gets connect, you know, a culture will start to, to take that and sort of manipulate it to its own benefit. But um, that constant desire to find patterns patterns of corruption, patterns, you know, of sexism and why it's bad or racism. So I do think this constant effort to understand the pattern is um, our only salvation, really. It's the only way to prevent just being driven by fear and pleasure and destroying each other, basically. Um, but it can get abused pretty easily. And that's that's what you know. We'll start talking about that. Um, Professor, I have a question. Yes. Regarding the article, uh, Professor, like, is it Aristotle was thinking that not everyone will be able to get the higher pleasure according to him? Well, he or... thinks 
that um, everybody should get be given the opportunity to develop to the highest level possible. And then he has that model of practical wisdom. And it has so many capacities in it. Like I could not achieve it uh, because I'm not good at public speaking. I can't persuade people to do stuff. And that's part of it. That's one of the virtues of being a good leader. But there's so many of them, right? You have to have all the intellectual virtues. You have to have all the moral virtues. You have to have um, the ability to make good laws. You have to be able to inspire people to want to follow the laws. You have to be able to know how to speak to people in a way that will motivate them. Uh, you know, so yeah, not everybody can do that. As a matter of fact, it's pretty rare. But so it's the standard, but everybody should get a chance to develop as much as they can. And then this process of talking to each other about how to live and evaluating other people's decisions and evaluating whether your leaders are good or bad. You could do that. And while you're doing it, you get better at deliberation. But still, you know, you could be good. Isn't it true that everybody is so much better at analyzing other people's lives than what they ought to be doing than their own? <laughs> I mean, <Yeah. laughs> okay, I'm not the only one. But uh, still, you know, when we do it, you know that some people are better at it than others, I think, right? Because some people just yeah. sort of say, well, they're not like me, and so there's something wrong with them. Um, and other people sort of try to speculate about another person's character, and you think, that's not true. I, again, I, I don't do this a lot, but a lot of people do. And some people are better than other people at doing that. Does that make sense to the rest of you? And you, and you do self-correct, right? You do tell each other that that's not true. That person isn't, this is what's really driving them or, or things like, how are you gonna convince them to do this, right? So all, I mean, I don't know, when I read that whole list of Aristotelian, of the virtues that a person of practical wisdom has to have, I have no problem thinking some people are better than others at that. Does that make sense, Ms. Soma? Uh, yes, yeah, Professor. I but of course it gets, it gets uh, corrupted. And so definitely, can you imagine how some Western person coming into a developing country could use Aristotle as this huge bludgeon, you know, because they could say, well, you know, you don't have, you know, this virtue and that virtue, and, and we have it because we've been exercising it for centuries, you know, so we need to come and, and control you. So does everybody understand how easily it could, be, well, how it was, you can, yeah, you can just imagine that it was used. Yeah. And that, you know, the other problem is when you're trying to do history, you have to, I think you have to speculate a lot because the documents aren't there, right? There aren't gonna be a lot of documents about, well, I told this person that they didn't have this, you know, quality of practical wisdom. They don't, they don't write that stuff down. And then of course you'd have to find it. I mean, the, the historical record is so minuscule compared to what actually went on in history that I do think you have to speculate. You just have to say, well, of course they would have used that. And of course the people would have been intimidated um, and accepted a certain amount of oppression. Um, even if we, you know, we don't have a record of it. It's just, it makes sense that it happened. And that's why if we're gonna use Aristotle now, first, we're gonna to have to acknowledge it got abused, it can still get abused. It can be used in ways that are racist, sexist, cultural bigotry, all, all those mistakes can get made, but 
I don't think we should therefore throw out the whole structure. Um, does that make does everybody understand that? That's that's education, you know. Like when you're asking yourself, what is a healthy psyche? Just the activity of asking it and thinking and reflecting and re-examining that itself is developing your mind. That is what your mind is. Uh, does that make sense to people? Your mind is your thinking about your thinking. <laughs> All right. Yeah, Professor, I, I, it completely makes sense for me. And then uh, it also makes sense why people uh, do some certain evil. So I think Aristotle was completely right about this, that human have, you know, the potential for the great good and the great evil. <laughs> So yeah, we can see it in our, you know, professor, even in the history, I mean, this much danger that human beings uh, do uh, uh, like with their uh, same creature, none of the, any other animals did. I mean, we, yeah, scientifically it was proved professor. I was watching a documentary, what was saying which animal is most dangerous. There was a snake and something and then the, at the first place, human beings dangerous to human. And then they, I mean, the deaths that happened because of the human killing each other was very, very high than those of, I mean, on the collection of those animals, the wild animals or. Well, they, yeah. kill, they kill members of their own species, right? And they call it civilized, right? Civilized killing. I mean, good God, what a, you know, only, only a creature with language could possibly, you know, act so unnaturally how could there be civilized killing of your own kind well and i think that's why people come back from wars psychologically damaged because that is not natural um yeah. but you know human beings and they also they always have some idea of the good why this has to happen why this will promote justice they always have to tell themselves some story about why this is the best choice, which it could actually be. It's just, it's just that we are creatures of culture. We are driven by our ideas after, and a child comes to a certain point and it's sometime in high school. And then if you get to leave home for college, it bounces way up where you really do start thinking about your thinking and that's where you're developing your mind and that's when you need to be exposed to all sorts of other people's ideas about goodness and justice and all their experiences and um so that you can start thinking you know critically about all these things but i guess i'll i'll get to that more later um i just <laughs> you punched my button masoma so my button is all human beings by nature seek understanding. That doesn't make us good. It makes us like with a lot of possibilities <laughs> and a lot of ways to deceive ourselves and a whole lot of garbage. Um, Mosa, have Maywish, have you gotten up out of bed yet? <laughs> I think it's 4 a.m. or something for her in Italy, but it, last time she came on, she looked pretty tired. But hey, May Wish, you got to do it. Um, so, Mosa, are you there? I don't see her anymore. Um, now. Yes, Professor. But I'm sorry, I didn't have any part for today because I just read around 10 pictures, I think, and then I didn't really understand. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's okay. You tried. That was, you know, I, I hope by the end of today, you'll understand why it's here. And, and then I really need to show you what comes next. Um, all right. Uh, new chat. Did you read? Are you there? Oh yeah, that's right. She didn't, <laughs> she's not here. Pooja. Yes, Professor. Did you read the assignment? 
No, Professor. I was busy in writing other assignments yesterday night, so I couldn't. Sorry. Okay. I've actually caught up um, to everything that you had handed in a couple days ago, except for three of the humanism ones. So about two or three days ago, I got my list and um, I have three left, but um, anyway, I'm starting another class at my other school, so I don't know how quickly I'll be able to get things done, but I'll try. Um, all right, so Rita, did you read? Or is she there? Is Rita there? No. Nope. Ratika? Professor, can I say my points? Oh, sure. Okay. Professor, I couldn't read the whole. But uh, the things that I have read, the first thing when I was reading, so it was not really clear on the first three pages. But when I went to the page 15 and did after that, so the first thing came to my mind that it is going uh, very small points to the large points. Like it, it, it connected the, uh, it connects the, uh, memory, it connects to the ecosystem, how the body, uh, the physical uh, body function, and how it reflects to the mind, our to our cycle. And, um, and then it talks about how the activity of the relationship between uh, the eye and uh, is working, and all the process of the body system and how it uh, gives the reflection of the human nature with the, uh, comparing with the another animal and uh, and like how I should say I don't know I'm I'm clear or not uh, so it basically what I have learned that it is linking the physical body with the mental what I analyze uh, because it was talking about the smelling testing and touching those things because that exists in the physical body of the human that it is uh, it is uh, giving the reflection or the reaction to the mental health and uh, it uh, uh, in in and the another point was that i was reading that it is related this to the memory uh, to the uh, com the complex uh, activity of the soil that how it function and how it connect to the content with the environment with each the sensible objective that is exist. So uh, the experience that we are getting from this content and uh, again, the power that we are having those in our soul and the organism that is uh, doing those all activities and this all what I have learned. Okay, good. Um... All right, so where was I? Ritika, are you there? Okay. Yes, Professor, I'm here. Did you come up with something? Uh, no, Professor, I skimmed the paper, but I don't have comments. Okay, let's see. Somebody. Um, okay. Um, is Shahira there? I don't think she came. Sumaya, I don't think she's there. Supti, are you there? Okay. All right. Okay, so um, here's, well, here was the other good news. I assume it's good news for you. Um, I'm only going to require 12 posts. Okay, I assume you all heard about that. Um, but, but you do need every time to write, write in and say, I did read it. <coughs> right? And I spent X time on it, right? You don't have to write anything else. You can comment if you want, but 
but you do have to clock in, right? So I do need every student to have posted something so that, you know, you can't just stop taking the class at this point. Um, so some of you, those of you who are behind might rather do your posts that are more recent, so they're in your mind, um, rather than try to go back and go back over, you know, material that we covered a long time ago and, you know, the YouTube channel and all that. So there are a lot of you who haven't handed things in. I mean, it's incredible. If everybody does hand everything in, I'm going to have just hundreds, hundreds of posts. So, uh, yeah, maybe 300 I'm missing right now. Uh, okay, so who had their... Okay, so does it mean like we have to submit on, I mean, until up to 12 posts only, right? I mean, we don't need to do the post number 13 and 14. Yeah, it doesn't matter what the number is because I'm going to go... That's why I like this Google thing, you know, the grades. And then I look and I just add up all your point total on all your posts, and then I divide by 12, and that's it. I even bought a little, a super little cheap calculator. <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> I'm not doing a machine, I'm holding my hand just like a really old lady, but okay, whatever. Um, anybody else? Masoma, you have a question? Uh, yeah, Professor, I was saying that, you know, I missed uh, last class, which was about global feminism, and I was listening to the recording of the class, though my connection was very weak and it was breaking down, and it took a lot of time for me to watch at least half of the class until students give the comments. So, yeah, but then I found it very interesting. I, I was really sorry it was my, you know, favorite topic, <laughs> but then I missed the class. But then, yeah, I read the whole article and also the outline and also like want to write my outline. Um, yeah. Then right. So, was, go ahead. So, Professor, can I submit that because uh, I submitted uh, 12 posts, so, but then I want to submit post 13 as well i'll just i a lot of time on it <laughs> yeah it's you just i'll just give you more points and divide by 12 right and it'll raise your grade um or you could write a, a research paper on that or you could because global feminism you can easily find articles about that um or you can put it in your final paper but Whatever you'd like to do at this point, if you've got 12 of them in, you have a lot of options. Um, yeah, so the last time the big issue was, I had written my paper about feminism using Martha Nussbaum, using the capabilities approach, using Mary Wollstonecraft. Everybody thought it was just peachy keen and wonderful, you know. And then you go that these women actually went over to the developing countries and they had all their biases and you could see it as another kind of colonialism. And so you're pitting women against women and, you know, we're doing this all over again. And so today, you know, the assignment that I put on your announcement was, okay, now let's take Aristotle and run him through the shredding machine in terms of class or, you know, gender, yeah, you could, right? You can do that. And it's just a matter of the baby in the bathwater, like get all the bathwater out of there. And then, but if you say it's all relative, then sexism is okay, right? As long as people accept it. And uh, yeah, exactly. yeah, and the AUW sisters are all a bunch of maladaptive weirdos and they need to go home and get socialized better, you know? Like, really? So, you know. There was one point that really offended me was that, you know, they were mentioning that uh, in the developing countries, you know, even if we gave this opportunity for the women, like the job opportunities, the wage was, I mean, very low and the condition was worse, the hour was long, but then it, 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 it still, it was better for them because, uh, you know, it makes their situations a bit better. But then I was like, 
do you know anything about humanity or justice? Is there anything existent, uh, like something uh, like humanity? Uh, if you're saying that I make their conditions a bit better at least, but then uh, you you know that they deserve you know higher wages, and then their condition was worse, even if uh, it was you know you are making their condition good, maybe a little better, but it wasn't justice, right? Okay. So I was I was so offended by that that they were saying we make their conditions a bit better than and then. And they also have the double shift, right? So now they have this job where yeah. they bring in a little more money, but they have a double shift. Like they're lying. Yeah, that's also like arguable, Professor, that whether they really make their condition better or not. Right. Even the, the yeah, way to do, you know. Um, I remember one time I was in a, a little van and I was in Indonesia and I was heading out to another smaller town where I was giving a lecture. And it just happened that the, the factory, probably a textile factory, was it was the end of the work day. And it was women who were coming home from work and their husbands were picking them up on motorcycles, right? And it just, it, it just they were exhausted, right? And then they go home and they have to cook dinner and they have to take care of the kids. And it was just... <laughs> Yeah, it just sort of, it hit home. You know, I read about this stuff, but it's kind of nice to see it with your eyeballs. Um, but that's where um, learning how to see with your eyeballs. So an educated person should see things differently, right? So when I saw that, I didn't just see some little event. I saw this whole thing about, you know, capitalism, international capitalism, how it's affected women and all this stuff I'd read. So it was just one trigger, right? And I could say that's the pattern, right? That's what's going on all over the world. There are other experiences people have that might have an emotional, they might react to, but it's not a pattern. It's an exception and it's really important to make those distinctions. And so you have to learn how to see things with your mind and not with your eyes, right? Or you have to exactly. train your eyes to see through the lens of culture, not just with your eyeballs. And, and so that, that matters quite a bit. Um, all right, so what I'll do, what time is it? Okay, I will talk for a while because um, that'll give you more of a chance during the break to take, you know, to write down and work on your posts. Um, I don't think you'd have a lot to write at this point about on your post. Um, and I did want to give you a chance to get quite a bit of the posts done before the end of class. Um, so let me go back to the screen share and, um, explain to you how this article fits in with what we've been doing and what we're going to do. Um, first of all, um, we have covered the Enlightenment and we've covered Aristotle and we've talked about paradigm shifts. This one is saying, okay, the contemporary world is a new paradigm, systems thinking, but it actually has a lot in common with the ancient paradigm. So it has more in common with it than you might think, right? Because we know the ancients were sexist, racist, classist, whatever. But if you look under the surface, you know, open up the packaging and look at the substance, it's holistic thinking. It's character, it's integration, it, it includes, and so it's, um, it shouldn't have been thrown out completely. And there are a lot of very prominent philosophers who understand this. So that's what I wanted you to understand that um, Whitehead, uh, Laszlo and Davies are three examples of people who are completely embedded in 
um, relativity physics, quantum physics, artificial intelligence, and their ideas about the psyche are more like the ancients than they are like the enlightenment. So the one really important thing is that the rationalism of Kant, the separation between mind and body, when he said we have these a priori ideas that we superimpose on the world, that's been refuted. And then the empiricism that just says, we're just going to gather information and then we're going to be able to use social science to control behavior. That kind of reductionist point of view has also been refuted. Like that's dated. And now the thing that's, that the research is finding actually is more like the ancients. Um, go ahead, Masoma. Uh, professor, uh, I don't know about uh, Kant, but then, yeah, Descartes was also like, you know, had this Descartes, yeah. So Kant I was thinking Descartes. about it. It, yeah. it is uh, Descartes, so also Kant, Professor? Yeah, both of them are mathematicians, and both oh. of them had dualism, right? For, um, for Descartes, he separated himself from everything. And then he had this idea of God that was totally separate. And this idea of his mind. And, and yeah, so it's dualism. And then Kant also. So those are usually put together because they have that basic foundation is that your mind is separated. It's not the result of your biological evolution or anything like that. Whereas the utilitarians said, no, it's all about evolution. We're just a kind of animal. And, um, and what's really been, you know, emerged in the way that people think about things now is that consciousness, self-conscious reflection is a product of evolution but it is the way our minds work is our thoughts cause thoughts. So we can have, we live in a world of ideas and the idea of God, right? So you could believe that a God made us that way, right? Or that that's what the expression made in the image of God means. Or you could just meet, you could just say it's it's an evolutionary event. It's an emergent property. So once again, this is value neutral in terms of religion being good or uh, or bad, and humanism being good or bad. It's just a it's a kind of humanism system thinking, which is different than a, a Kantian humanism or utilitarian humanism, or, um, you know, if you remember that whole section by Corliss Lamont in the Humanist Manifesto, 1933, 1973, 2000, they're much more down on religion, and they separate religion from science more than Laszlo does, or Whitehead does, or um, Davies does. So again, I want my students to absolutely feel free to have any position they want. And all I'm doing is showing them that every possibility um, has a legitimate you know, argument for it. The only thing that doesn't is bigotry, right? You're, you're, you, know, you can't be virtuous unless you're Christian. That's is completely discredited. Um, or you can't be virtuous unless you're an atheist. That's completely discredited, right? So there's stuff that, that has got to go, um, but within that, it's a much bigger space here, cultural space for people to have different points of view and still be, um, be faithful 
to the view of reality and the view of psychology that is emerging in our time. Um, all right, does that address what you wanted to say? Ask Lasova. Yeah, yeah, Professor, completely. Professor, what I found, like, you know, all of these philosophers and, you know, famous people, they are all, I mean, agree that how much important is, like, you know, reasoning or critical thinking, but then they completely have different approach. Some of them are good or some of them, like, yeah, related to other things as well. So the point is that they have this common view, all of them. <laughs> well, in theory, if they think, you know, self-examination is really important, then if somebody says to them, uh, yeah, and I think you're being sexist over here, <laughs> they shouldn't be defensive. Oh, no, you know, I mean, they should. Oh, yeah, I hadn't realized that, right? So some of them really won't admit their own ignorance, you know? And, and <laughs> yeah. so they, they, you know, they don't practice what they preach. And, um, I understand that because when I was publishing a lot, there were about 10 years when I just published, I don't know, I think it like eight books in 10 years or something and a whole bunch of articles. I was just completely obsessed. And, but I wasn't living virtuously at all. I was not practicing what I was preaching. So I was sitting there writing articles about sitting in your office, writing articles is stupid. You got to live your life. Now I got to write another article about it. <laughs> and uh, I knew, I knew that I wasn't practicing what I was preaching. Um, but I had had quite a complex life before that. And I, and now I, I don't write that much anymore because I don't, I don't want to go there. That was hard. But I just had had a lot of ideas and I just disagreed with all these well, you know, the people in my profession are privileged white Western men for the most part, and they are ignorant. They do not know the meaning of what they say. They keep projecting themselves into their the words, the theory, and they don't realize not everybody would interpret it that way, right? When you tell somebody they're free to invent reality, they're not necessarily going to invent something you will approve of, <laughs> but you told them they could invent anything they want to. And, and they're just, they just can't get that because they have so much privilege. They can't understand really somebody else's point of view. Uh, but anyway, I, I, uh, I, uh, let's see. I, I think that, what I want to say here is that um, systems thinking requires just this high level of self-examination and just a continual process. And that's what I wanted each of you to sort of go through as the course evolves, right? That it's sort of set up for you to do that. Um, so let me go through this for a second. Again, I'm holding you longer, but I want to give you something of substance that you could react to. Um, first of all, the basic principle of reality is that what's most immediate to us is least important. And what's most important is least immediate. So what's most important is the universe, right? And the circular circular motion of the planets and even though the universe is expanding that there are these principles of order the nuclear uh, you know the weak nuclear force the strong nuclear force gravity and electromagnetism so there are these basic forces that holds thing in, in place uh, and then within that, you know, the solar system came to be our solar system. And within that, the Earth. And within that, the gradual evolution from non-living to living. And from that to higher order uh, creatures. And from that to human beings. And then after that, there was this huge leap to um, self-conscious awareness. So, 
So we have to keep that in mind because if you want your mind to reflect the universe, you have to keep everything in perspective. And the problem is we are a kind of animal. And so we have these sensations and we tend to react, you know, we get hungry and all this stuff. But if you want to have a mind, you've got to keep it focused on much bigger picture stuff. So, so that's one basic principle. And the next, um, okay, that things, things do change. So there's, there's a principle of change, which genetic mutations make it possible for stuff to change. They create all this potentiality. But every when something comes to be like a new species, it has to do so within what's already there. So as the ecosystem emerges, um, to, in order for there to be a new niche, right, a new species, it has to, there has to be a space for it relative to what's already there. So what's ordered um, creates the limiting conditions for what comes to be. So the, so the universe in general and the ecosystem is this incredible combination of potential for novelty for something new and then um, the limiting condi conditions within which that has to take place. And so it's beautiful, right? Evolution is toward higher and higher levels of complexity. So by analogy, the human psyche is the same. It evolved gradually over time. It became the more, as we used our minds to form, to understand patterns, it worked. And so we, you know, we worked on that more. And so we, we develop more complex social systems and then that worked pretty well. So we got more complex and we just kept trying new things. And so social evolution tends to go toward higher and higher levels of complexity. Um, but because we also have this basic survival stuff, pleasure and fear, our social systems can break down. And we can devolve into a lower level of culture. It's always a possibility throughout history that's happened. Uh, why? Well, because society's systems break down for various reasons. Uh, lots of books are written about this collapse, all this sort of stuff. Um, but anyway, the idea of fitness that we are the animal that's capable of understanding in a world that's understandable. That's what made us fit. That's what made us successful. Um, pattern recognition. Okay. So then the other, the goal in life is a correspondence between what's actually out there and what I think. So when what I think is actually out there, then you use the word true and, um, and false. Now, this is a very old fashioned idea. It was completely discredited. Uh, in the enlightenment, they reinvented truth, right? Truth is within a system like Kant or um, there's the, the data of science and social science, but then there's all sorts of, how do you create a hypothesis that you can support? Um, and then human beings change a lot. So the data that you had, like there was so much social science data before 9-11 and all of a sudden 9-11 and, you know, throw that out the window, you know, none of that's gonna work. All the ideas you had about what to do how to stimulate, you know, provide pleasures and pains to get people to behave a certain way after 9-11, forget it. <laughs> so, so that stuff just comes and goes. It's so transient. Um, and so, yeah, so the notion of truth um, in the ancients is you find patterns, right? You can't, you can't find, you know, there's too many variables to think you could actually control behavior in a certain way. You wanna figure out if something happens that triggers fear, 
what sort of reaction should you have, right? Which sort of reactions to a fearful event are more likely to preserve social stability and which ones are less likely to do so? That's a better thing to study than to study in the US, you know, 1995, okay, so advertising, this kind of advertising has worked in the past and people are sort of moving in this direction. And then 2000, you know, 9-11 happens and it's, it's, it's completely illegitimate. So anyway, so that's, that's where we're going. Um, that the enlightened views were thrown out. Now the next three classes is another version of the throwing out of the enlightenment view and replacing with neuroscience. So we're gonna study neuroscience and then the last week of class, you can report on your research papers and you report on your final papers. So the only new material I'm gonna give you is three different parts of a book I wrote responding to a neuroscientist. So neuroscience is incredibly trendy right now. It is the thing. If you're an empiricist kind of researcher and you're studying the human psyche. So um, that so I, you know, I think you you need to know that. It's just that I read this book. And I, and I, the guy doesn't know that what he's looking for is ancient Greek culture. He doesn't even know it. <laughs> and that's because of the way our, our educational system works. It's so specialized. And all of you understand you worship science and then you worship neuroscience. These, these are looked to for salvation. And so now we have it once again, the two worst extremes, we have neuroscience that's too reductionistic, and then we have religion that's too dualistic, and then it gets used as a tool to divide people. So, you know, there's always that pull that, that um, devolves society, right? That um, undermines higher order culture, and then, um, so you always have to keep working on figuring out that middle ground, right? What's, where is the point where all this stuff really comes together? Um, all right. So I, yeah, I'm going to have to let you go, although I don't know how much you can say, but Whitehead just talks about two kinds of reason and that the Greeks understood that speculative reason, thinking about the good, thinking about virtue, justice, truth is uh, important and it can be tied down to logic and reasoning. So that was the Greeks idea, wisdom, and then speculative reason. Of course, it wasn't just the Greeks, there were plenty of other people, the Hindus and the Buddhists, everybody's, everybody's doing it. So I think what Whitehead should have said is in the West, <laughs> right? Uh, way before that, there was lots of other stuff. So, um, and then speculative reason is where you decide what you want and then you calculate how to achieve it. So you can decide you wanna to come to AUW, you calculate. You know, you have to take this test, you have to get this visa. I mean, all of you did a ton of things in this calculating way in order to end up at AUW. But, but people also can have the goal of how can I get as rich as possible? And then they use their speculative reason to get as rich as possible, right? And some of them are better at it than others. But so you can use that kind of reasoning for good or evil. Okay, um, then Laszlo is this, this uh, view of evolution. And he says that every major religion has the base, same basic intuitions about the good. And that's important because um, 
that means there is a common ground. So even though religion is getting used as a weapon by a lot of politicians right now, because in a situation of fear, you know, when people are afraid, you can really, religion becomes a really powerful tool. So it's important that you know that that's an abuse of the basic intuition of the religions. And many of you wrote about the book Nomad, and they said, which is true, she's completely oversimplifying Islam. Like that isn't fair to Islam. And then she's completely idealizing the West and the Enlightenment. Yeah, she had, she's a dualistic thinker. And she, uh, we'll, we can talk about that more. But um, I think you should use her as an example of what not to do and how to get beyond that and make sure that the relationships that you create with other people are not based on that kind of dualism because it's very harmful. Um, but the same with some kinds of humanism. Humanism that absolutely demonizes religion is not faithful to the system's thinking, to the reality that we're facing. Um, and then again, with quantum physics, and it's this is contemporary stuff. This is not naive pie in the sky. It's not ancient. It's not dated. It's actually recent. And so he's talking about um, artificial intelligence. Um, and what he talks about, again, I think I'll, um, I'll just drop this, but I'll pick it up after the break, is for you to think about, you need to think about how much of what you think is really a concept. It's not a physical thing. It's an abstract concept. Like, what is a Wednesday, right? Is a Wednesday something you can pick up? <laughs> no, it's, it's completely dependent on, inner, on relationships and on agreements about uh, its culture. It, it's culturally created. It corresponds to some extent to the sun, but it really, Wednesday, that's just a concept. And then um, the concept of uh, a symphony, right? The idea, like right? what the idea that Beethoven had that drove him to write these little black marks on paper, right? And then when you go see a performance of a symphony, the real source of it was Beethoven's mind. It was all in his head, right? It wasn't a physical thing, but it was a relation. I mean, it had physical parts, but the whole, the, the symphony is way greater than just the sum of the parts. And then you have the way the composer forms it in his mind, right? And the way he directs the, the players to play it and the way the players relate to each other and whether they, you know, whether they, integrate whether they play together and then you know then there's the actual violin or the actual black marks on the paper but the world we live in is way way bigger than the merely physical things that we encounter um, and the culture is way way bigger than any piles of information that we can get, right? We can get so much information, but, but it should be obvious to you that people want to understand that information. And so they come up with conspiracy theories or God's will. Those are all uh, intellectually dishonest, but they are driven by the desire to understand, right? I want to know what this means. I want to know what coronavirus means. And so it's that desire to understand that is the cause of all these really, you know, conspiracy theories and bad religion. Um, so I hope you understand that. It's still driven by that same desire. It's just a complete perversion of that desire.
Um, okay, so it's 20 minutes after. So I'll give you till 35 minutes after. And if you, you know, in your post, if you wanted to just reflect a little bit on what does it mean to be the creature that naturally desires to understand? How is it that conspiracy theories are related to that desire? Because it doesn't seem like that at first glance, right? Okay, so 15 minutes. Um, I guess. Let me see if there's. Professor, you can stop rec pause the oh, recording. Thank you for reminding me. Animals aren't forgetful. You know, they take care of their, they have a, a lot more practical wisdom. They know what to do. Of course, we call it instinct. Um, but then, you know, you can ask, do some animals have self-conscious awareness? Well, I mean, at a certain level, why not? I mean, you don't, it's that they don't have it to the level that we have. Um, so. <laughs> Diana, mute yourself. <laughs> Oh dear, that's okay. All right. Okay, I can mute yours. Thanks. Um, yeah, speaking of forgetful, yeah. Um, okay, so let me go to the paper here. So I am going to go back to the paper and um, the paper itself and go through it here for a minute. Um, well, not just for a minute, right? For what I'm going to do is go through the paper and then I really do want each of you to give some comment. So think about something that strikes you about this paper. All right, so the premise is we are destroying our natural environment. We are fouling our nest and we don't care. Like we know we're doing it and we don't care. And why, right? We have all this science and it's telling us, don't do this, and we're doing it. So why on earth would we call ourselves the rational animal? This is crazy. Like we're, we're the most irrational creature in the universe. Um, but anyway, so, so what's going on with systems thinking? So systems thinking is holistic and it is telling us we need to integrate culture and nature, and we need to develop our minds in a way that keeps us connected to the natural world and the universe, right? As a whole, that we would see ourselves in relationship to the universe and to nature. That was not what the enlightenment wanted. It wasn't their idea of the good. The idea of the good was that we are totally plastic and we can use our reason to manipulate behavior or to educate the disembodied mind and, a, and human beings will choose to be virtuous and just. And um, 
that's not, it didn't work. And, um, and it isn't even the right goal. So system thinking is saying, you've got the wrong goal, you've got the wrong idea of reason and the mind. And modern scientific research has confirmed this. That's, that's the last point, is that I'm not just an old fuddy-duddy who doesn't want change. It's that what's actually out there requires that the enlightenment be replaced, seriously replaced with something else. Plus, deconstruction was a reaction, right? Postmodern is just deconstructing moderns. But it itself is just doesn't, it's not systems thinking. It doesn't advocate the kind of integration with nature. And so again, Academics are sitting in their offices, punching holes at everything, and yet they depend upon the, everybody else in the world to create sustainable societies, to create sustainable cultures, to make their life so luxurious that they can sit in their offices and just spin out stuff without having to make any contribution to the culture. They just sit there and show, oh, those other guys' view of truth is wrong. And um, yeah, that's great. So what's right, Mr. Deconstructionist? And I, I have friends that do that. And I also have students that buy into it. And I say, OK, tell me what they think is right and how we ought to live. And this is like nothing. Um, thanks. <laughs> uh yeah however you want to live oh really and you can destroy the natural world it doesn't matter or you can destroy you know the integrity of a family or you don't have to be a responsible parent because that's all socially constructed no it's not you know kids need stability as a matter of fact so yeah it's annoying anyway so um, here we go with um, a rejection of the Enlightenment. Whitehead, let me point out, here's two kinds of reason. Speculative reason is the art of life, constantly thinking about how you want to live. So the Greeks also had this, that Ultimately, the most creative activity you engage in is the creation of your life, right? And you do that with your mind or your speculative reason. What is, what is a beautiful life? What is a life that's true to the universe, right? What does it mean to be faithful to the universe or, or true or uh, realize your place within the ecosphere in the biosphere. What is um, what is a integrated life where what you want and what you think and what you do is integrated? What and in a person with integrity would have to follow the golden rule. They would have to treat other people the way they want to be treated, because a double standard lacks integrity. You want other people to be suckers so that you can have more money. <laughs> Anybody who wants to be rich or powerful has to want other people to fail or to be manipulated by them. They're, they can't have integrity. They can't integrate. They can't, like Kant would say, will that this be a universal law for everyone. Um, so, so speculative reason, and this is what I think a lot of you do during the COVID, right? You started out freaking out and panicking, right? You went to a lower level of thought and human interrelationships or whatever culture. And then you started thinking your way to a higher level. So a number of you wrote really nice papers. I was gonna read from your papers. Maybe I'll have time about how the COVID did 
force you to really start thinking about your thinking and thinking about your life. And I hope that you think of it as a creative activity. Like you're literally creating your life in your living of it. Um, and, and the idea of having a beautiful life, right? Just means like a flourishing life. But I think when you add the word beauty, um, I don't know, in my mind, it means that, well, you take pleasure in doing the right thing. But there's all this sort of nuance when you say something is beautiful. It's way over and above what it needs to be to be functional without being ostentatious or, um, you know, drawing attention to itself. But anyway, so that's speculative reason. And Whitehead says that that's a, that is the way nature works. Nature is, is working toward achieving its perfection. Each plant and animal wants to be as perfect as possible. But just when human beings, um, they have a lot more choices and they disagree a lot more <laughs> about what the heck that means. But Whitehead said, you know, that Einstein's relativity theory is much more like final causation. It never should have been thrown out uh, entirely. Um, okay. Then, yeah, Cartesian dualism. Well, Whitehead criticizes both Cartesian dualism and Kant's dualism. And he said that that's been really harmful, which it has, because you just look at the natural world as this inert thing for you to manipulate, rather than as having all of, as consisting of a system of creatures that are all seeking their perfection. And so are you. Um, let's see. Um, yeah, and he applauds the Greeks because this capacity for thinking about the good, it, they didn't refer to some supernatural God and say, oh, it's God's will. And again, that still happens a lot. A lot of you wrote about that, that that's just sort of a, an excuse for not having to think through stuff. Um, just say it's God's will and that sort of solves everything. So the Greeks said, wait a sec. <laughs> no, no that the idea of the good has to be, you know, brought down to earth and subjected to reason. But, you know, it's an idea of the good. It's beyond, you can think of a better world than the one you see. So, you know, insofar as science only discusses facts, when you're doing speculation, you just want an idea about what sort of culture you want in the future. And you literally make that true. So for AUW, they want the AUW culture and the students to envision a better world, a better culture that hasn't been, hasn't existed before, but women have the capabilities that they've always had them, they just haven't had the chance to activate them. And so AUW is a place where women are activating these capabilities, the faculty and the administrators and all that. And then women come, students come, and they're given all these opportunities to activate all these capacities and literally create new facts, right? Create a new culture, create a level of history, history, historic development, social evolution that hasn't existed before. And, but, but in order to do that, you have to be thinking about your thinking, right? Because it's not going to be something you necessarily observe and just draw an inference, right? You're not going to look at, at women, you know, like a scientist will look at all the data and conclude that yeah, things fall down if you drop them. All right. Nobody's going to look at the data and say, yeah, women are by nature PhDs in math, you know, because you're not, that's not what most of them are. So, but 
you know, people have concluded, well, they aren't because they can't be. And it's like, nope. So you're literally working on creating a, on social evolution. You're, you're put at AUW to be part of the process of social evolution. And this article explains why that's possible and why it's important. And if you don't, if you're not part of social evolution, especially in a COVID situation, you're going to be sucked into this way that fear and desperation could easily drive us backward, right? Into much more primitive um, societies and ways of relating to each other. So that's what I think every thoughtful people person should be worried about is that we start having fear drive us. We start having um, powerful, power-driven leaders uh, tap the fear button and get people so they don't trust each other and they don't have goodwill for each other, which Aristotle said that's fundamental to a basic level of culture. So uh, things can devolve. And so I I. I encourage you, right, to be part of the solution. And AUW tried to give you, you know, that opportunity. And again, we're all set back. But still, you know, it's it's better to head in that direction than to head um, than to let all these fears and frustrations get to you, you know, because somebody's got to lead, and um, you still have a life after. After COVID, you're going to have a life. So what kind of a life will it be? So Laszlo also is talking about systems, um, relationships. So what really, and evolution is a progression from simplicity to complexity, from um, less sophisticated to more sophisticated, from pre-living, pre-organic, organic, and then supra-organic is a uh, culture, suborganic, supra, or, and then what really drives the level of culture is reflective consciousness. That's the main tool that we have. We know that we know. Um, and we can think about our thinking. So again, I, you know, I like monkeys and all that. And I do think it's amazing how they take care of each other and they braid each other's hair and they do cool stuff. But they don't think about their thinking, right? They don't think, I don't know, I don't really want to um, scratch your back today because I think that, you know, <laughs> they don't do stuff like that. Um, they might show behavior that we would call jealousy or competition and that's fine it's just that human beings can think about the fact that they're jealous or they're competing and they can reconsider right and they can think i don't i don't i don't think jealousy is appropriate response again animals can have different response but it's still related to imitation. It's related to memory. They're not going to do anything because some of disembodied idea you know, came into their mind. Um, they're not going to starve themselves so they can go to heaven. They're just, they're not capable of that kind of reflective consciousness. And the fact that we are capable of it just gives us a huge responsibility because there's so many ways we can go wrong with it. There's so many kinds of corruption. Um, and that's the thing about the past, we've used this capacity in order to justify abusing the whole rest of the animal world, right? Treating animals like they're not worth nothing because we're made in the image of God and we're important and you're not. And so people, you know, intellectuals come back and say, no, you're not. You're just an animal. You know, that's not helpful. <laughs> we think and um, we form cultures based on thinking. 
They're superimposed upon the natural world. And he does talk about fulfillment, which is flourishing in Aristotle, what I've been talking about a lot. And then he talks about contemporary humanism. Um, so I hope you could follow that. And then he attaches that to the great religions. Um, and each religion has a humanistic branch. Each religion can get tied to humanism and should get tied to humanism. So systems thinking is not at all anti-religion, but it's anti-bigotry. Um, and we are deliberately in the process of, we're in the middle of creating, right? Of socially evolving uh, the story of humankind. I think women especially need to step up because finally they've been given opportunities um, okay, as of 60 years ago, when I was in college, only 5% of the people in law school and med school were women, right? And now it's 50, 55. What that means is that enough women have been given these opportunities so that they really could create a new kind of culture. Unfortunately, many of them are just completely accepting patriarchy and even sort of fawning and trying to compete again with each other for who can be the most pro status quo, which means patriarchy. But still, there's a lot of them that aren't. And so um, I think, excuse me, women are very much a part of social evolution, but also people in developing countries have um, made it clear to the rest of the world that they always did have all these capabilities. But I would say at this point in history, up until recently, the best and the brightest in these developing countries would come and study in the West and they would absorb all those ideas and they would take them home and they would preach them, you know, like the developing countries were wannabe Western because the West kept selling itself as the most evolved. And I, I just think Donald Trump and the US reaction to COVID, all this stuff, hopefully just makes the intellectual class in these developing countries rethink, right? And rethink about how they wanna lead their societies forward, that they can embrace those, the cultural past and just, the religious part of it, whatever. And using these basic humanistic values, they can create a culture that fits their society, that's humanistic, that's faithful to their tradition without being bigoted, without you know any of those corruptions. But they don't need to look to the West, but they, you know, um, I don't necessarily think I do think a free and open society is important, right? And we've been through that. It's just that the West doesn't have a lock on that. Um, it can be a goal that every country can seek and they can do it in their own way. Um, Indonesia, for example, they set up their democracy on, they had five principles and the first one was the belief in God like a western you know i thought you know i was like okay whatever because i my reaction is always to have an open mind and i've read this stuff it doesn't i can and then you want you think okay the founders of indonesia really understood why that fit their culture better um sometimes politicians use it as a bludgeon right to oppress people but i mean people can use the western Obviously, people use Western concepts as a bludgeon to oppress, too. So, um, so separating church and state isn't necessarily the best way to a free and open society. But I do think you can still have that as your goal, a free and open society where people can develop their critical thinking skills. They can dissent, you know, have different opinions about everything. They also can freely inquire about science. They can create artistic things. Um, 
And you really have to have a free mind in order to be healthy. So that's why in this class, I keep trying to, I'm trying to create a culture of freedom, right? That students can say what they like, but they have to respect each other, right? And they have to be fair to opposing points of view and those things. But anyway, so Laszlo doesn't think religion has to be uh, eliminated. And on systems thinking, it actually can be easily incorporated as long as it's humanistic. Okay, then Davies is talking about these concepts, right? That we actually live in a world of concepts. So to say that the mind is a concept isn't to say it doesn't exist. It's to say, yeah, it really does exist. It exists like Wednesdays exist and symphonies exist and um, uh, usefulness, right? Usefulness. I mean, we'll talk about all that time. Is that a material thing? No, it's a relationship. It's a very complex relationship. It's, the, it's what emerges from a whole lot of material things and the way they relate to each other. So usefulness is a concept. Organization is a concept. Information is a concept, right? They're not a thing. They're a relationship between things. So, um, so I, I hope that you can understand that. Just understanding, right? What is understanding? It's not a material thing. Um, uh, I will say when I'm walking in the morning by the lake, I am really shocked at what people talk about. Because to me, it's mindless. Like, it's arrested development. Like all they talk about is stuff they can see, right? And they're just talking about the color they painted their porch or some damn thing. And I, to me, that's such an abuse of your mind because animals think about the color. I mean, you know, animals can respond to the, the, you know, to me, you're using your mind where when you're in a world that an animal can't reach at all not because you think you're superior it's just that means you're using your mind right um so when you're talking about how to promote flourishing how to create a middle class that's uh the task of your mind but i don't know i i just worry about how many people have let themselves fall into a much lower level of operating because you know we are going to have terrible environmental problems the weather is going to change if they aren't thinking about this and anticipating this and thinking about how to you know prevent it from devolving it will right they shouldn't be surprised when it happens but they end up talking about this trivial stuff. It just drives me nuts. So I think where I live, because it's a wealthy country, people are just talk about trivial things. People where you live are probably talking about fear, right? They're probably afraid. And so they're, you know, coming up with it's God's will or God's wrath. Or um, one girl said that, I think it was, I think in Kashmir, she said, the reason why there's all this awful stuff is because people are sending their daughters to college. <laughs> Wait a sec. And, but that's typical, right? You got to find a woman to blame, just like Adam did. When he messed up, he blamed a woman, right? That's, that's the old trick. Let's do that again. Um, let's see. So... So that's what Davies is talking about, um, artificial intelligence, the two-level description um, is, uh, has been thrown out, and that now we're talking about the cognitive sciences, right? Um, linguistics, that's a concept, right? It has parts, but the whole is much greater than the sum of the parts. Um, systems that process information. And so 
information is not what the world is made of. It's how information is processed. And so when you start, when you're reflecting on things, one of the things that should be obvious is that everybody's subjected to COVID. Everybody, you know, has had this huge wrench. That's the, that's information, but everybody processes that information differently. And after the original panic or whatever, every one of you is processing that information differently and you're processing it with your mind, your idea of the good, your idea of who do I wanna be? How do I want to deal with that? That's the self-conscious awareness is that you are aware that you have a choice. You deal with it in the way you want to deal with it. And then you think about, well, how do I want to deal with it? What person, who do I want to be when this is over? And uh, one girl actually went back and made contact with her old grade school friends, right? Because she had time. So one of the girls, one of the students was saying um, she got closer to her family. Others of you, you know, no, you're domestic abuse. So, but the, but the key is, right, every time something happens, you know, it's a setback, there's always a part of you that can say, I have a choice, right? You always do have a choice. And the more you're aware of it, the more you can, empowered you can be. But I, the other thing is that friendships are important, right? Relationships. So I think, you know, the trouble is when you're really down and you really need a friend, you have to make sure you can trust the friend, right? And so when people are let down by their friends, then that's even worse, right? They have to do it alone. So, uh, but anyway, all of this stuff is about processing information. It's not about the mere material stuff of life. Um, so the way you compare it is the difference between the hardware of a machine and the software, right? So social media, is that affected by the structure of the machine that it's on? No. The whole social media world is a world based on relationships and ideas, ideas about the good, ideas about how you're going to live. Um, it's not mere bits of information. And it's driven by people's ideas about good and evil, justice and injustice. That's how you send and making sense why. They're trying to answer the question why. And they're obsessed with it. They want to find a cause. But, and that's what you do with your mind. It's just that they're settling for some really, really stupid explanations. So they're not being thoughtful, right? They're not being critical thinkers about this search for the cause. Um, okay. Mind is not just brain cell activity. And so that's what we're gonna keep working on with neuroscience. Um, Okay. Oh yeah, these people, Davies says that it's immortality of the soul. It's very possible that this level of mind could outlive your body. And he uses an analogy, right? That a story, you know, the story of the Iliad or the story of Jesus' life, it can it can be written on paper but it's really in people's minds and it could really live in some other form. So he, you know, he doesn't rule out the reality, the possibility of immortality in, in as much as we are literally creating ourselves at this level of thoughts causing thoughts. Um, all right. So what I wanted to get into um, 
the ingredient. So mind is made up of information, but the way we organize it is based on our choices about good and evil. Okay. All right, now Aristotle. So let me give you, let me explain how this works. Um, he says, and he's written this uh, book, De Anima, it's all the powers of the soul. So we have five senses. Now, why don't we have more than five? Uh, because you're, um, because the world, right? How is, why is it we have the sense of sight? Well, because the world is visible. Um, again, there were genetic mutations all over the place. Eventually, this mutation for the eye uh, evolved. It was one possibility. And it, it was fit, right? It actually worked. There was something out there. And so because there was something to be seen, it survived genetically. And so it's, it's an emergent property. It's a product of evolution, but it requires the object seen and then the eyeball to see it and also in the presence of light. So, so the evolution occurs within a context of this world, right? A, an earth and the sunlight and all that other stuff. I mean, it, it's common sense, except that it's denied, right? The correspondence theory of truth is completely discredited. So, all right. And then Aristotle will say, well, why don't we have a better sense of sight like the eagles? Or why don't we have a worse sense of sight like some other animal? And he would say that the degree to which we have each of these senses has been, has evolved to the, for the sake of using our brain, right? Like if we could hear as well as some animals, we wouldn't be able to think very much because we, you know, we'd hear all this stuff. Or if we could see too much, we wouldn't be able to think. So that's how we've evolved. We have a certain degree of sight, hearing, smelling, tasting, and touching, just enough to achieve our ultimate purpose is to use our brains and to understand patterns. That's what evolution has, has led. You could just say the universe is ordered. And it was long before our species evolved. But because it was, eventually, the species is going to evolve whose destiny is to understand patterns because they're out there, right? So the universe was visible long before there were any creatures that could see it, right? It was, it sound existed way before the ear could hear it. But anyway, so that's why we have the senses we have. That's why we have them to the degree we have them. Then after the senses, we don't just get these bits of information. What we get is perception. Perception is that your sense data comes in in relationship to time and place, right? You get the stuff in, in a context, in a physical context. And then, so we have this power of perception and we can, you know, we can analyze this. None of this stuff ever exists separately, but we can separate the parts and figure out that this is gradually how we evolved. Then after perception comes, um, I think it's memory. Let me make sure. There's perception. Yeah, memory. So then, so we have we have sensations where all the senses come together and they come together in time and in place, right? We get the sense, time and place, and then it's before and after memory. So we get, we start to understand something happened before something else. And then we start being able to remember the before. So all of a sudden, we're aware of more than is just in front of our eyes. Then, um, 
after memory, um, let's see. And he says that, let me see. We also have appetites, right? We have desires, um, eating, drinking, sex. So we have those and those drive us and they drive our, the way we use our brains. Um, and so animals also have memory and they have desires, obviously, and it drives their behavior. So we have these instinctual drives. Um, let's see. But animals don't, unless they live with human beings, they, they don't become anorexic and they don't get obese, right? They, in the wild, they don't, you know, they're hungry, they eat, they're, you know, it's, they don't go to extremes like we do. Because again, we have choices and we have to live by the power of our minds. Like we can't avoid it. Um, so we always have to choose. So then we have to find out, you know, what's a healthy way to eat, especially now. I mean, there were, well, there was a long time there when they didn't have a lot of choice. But within the context, it is interesting to see how. Uh, the creatures evolved, they were able to figure out what to eat that was available where they were that was healthy. And so, um, again, that has to be connected to memory. And that's starting to engage in scientific empiricist investigation, right? So you start understanding the patterns, which things um, make you healthy. Um, let's see. Um, where's the list? Appetites, and then deliberative imagination is thinking about what to what to pursue, right? In terms of pleasure, pain, sex. Um. Ah, uh, yeah, the notion of will is that you're aware, okay, you're aware of your capacity to choose this or that, and you're aware of your desire, what you want to choose, but then you're also always capable of self-correcting and reflecting. So you're always able to, come to subject your desires to reason, right? So you wanna eat something that's not healthy, your reason, you can add, you know, you can defer to reason or not. Um, and that, that, that idea is the, gets translated will, but Aristotle will just basically say um, it, that it's awareness of choice and then choosing, it's based on your idea of good and evil, what you choose. Um, okay, so here's his little summary, and this is important because he does, you know, we start out with sensation, animals live by appearances and memory, and have less connected experience, okay? Now, I've read about octopuses, octopi have personalities, and I read about, you know, there was this female octopus and these two males were sort of going after and competing for her attention. And that's fine. I mean, I don't think Aristotle would be at all. He liked studying plants and animals. He, he would prefer to study them than human beings. <laughs> so he, he's not trivializing animals by doing this, even though a lot of Aristotelians did. It's just a, a level of conscious awareness, right? And so courtship behavior, you could say that animals have sophisticated courtship behavior, that's fine. It's just that human beings have more than just courtship behavior, right? They don't, if, if someone, if a, to a male and female are attracted to each other and they start dating, they always have choices right? 
they they aren't ever sucked into some species driven courtship behavior they can always stop or they can they can do all sorts of stuff that's really weird and you know not related to any survival not related to actually having sex and reproducing which is our survival instinct they can make any sorts of decisions they want and they do right they say, well, you're not in my religion, so I can't be attracted to you or I can't go out with you anymore. I mean, that happens all the time, right? Because of your religious belief. No animal would do that. <laughs> and we just do it routinely. Um, so that's, that's the point I want to make, is that we live by art and reasoning. Okay, so how does that work? For okay, so if you're a doctor and you're good at you start with experience, right? People come in with a symptom and then you start to see the pattern, and then you start to think, oh, people with this, you give them this because this has worked. That's experience. Um, and but the, the next level art is you understand why it works, okay? So a doctor, he says, a person of experience, a doctor might actually cure somebody better than the one who knows the cause because the one who knows why it works might actually not have all the right information about this particular client, right? This particular patient. Whereas the person of experience might be able to make a better judgment. But, but so the person with art knows why something works. And again, animals don't ask why. Why does this work? Um, let's see. And so he says, uh, we usually respect people who know why because they can teach, all right? And so basically Aristotle is teaching why human beings, um, why we live by art, why all these things happen. It's because of the human condition and it's because we've evolved in a certain way. So he, his work is trying to give you the theoretical foundation, but you can be, Aristotle might have been a brilliant theoretician. He could have been a real dud in terms of, you know, he might not have been a good person. He might have sat in his study his whole life and just cranked out theories. But he even says that. He says most people would rather talk about virtues than actually act virtuously. <laughs> so he might be able to say, yeah, I know. Uh, I'm a great theoretician, but, and I really respect a complete life where you're exercising all these virtues, but I don't have a complete life. I have a really incomplete life because I'm just studying theory. So, um, so, but still, I think that his books, his ideas um, are valuable, right? Because, because that's what gets passed down, right? The people who are seeking the causes for things are the ones that pass down their theories or their discoveries to the next generation. And then the next generation can pick up on it and correct for it. And, um, um, you know, social evolution goes forward. So um, Mary Wollstonecraft, for example, understood that she was smarter than most other men. And so she fought for women's education, right? Why, why are women treated this way? John Stuart Mill, why? And why do they need to be given equal rights? So John Stuart Mill himself had, a, had an affair with a married woman and he had his problems, but he passed on this theory that has inspired people, right? And so that's what the theoretician has to offer. Um, and theories are powerful because people use them. Um, so for example, Muhammad, he, he passed on a way of life 
and he's a role model. And um, but people pick up on it. And sometimes it inspires them, and they carry on a really good tradition. But it can always get corrupted. Same with Jesus. Same with everybody. But that's how you're constantly um, being self-critical. So uh, let's see. All right. Okay. Sorry, Professor. Go ahead. Uh, because my laptop charges around 45%. So can I leave? Because I have another class too. Sure, Diana. Thank you, Professor. Of course. Of course. Um, so this is the section where in practical with oh about raising children, obviously they it's difficult, right? Having all these virtues, intellectual, having all these is hard. And so I talk about raising children um, and that today too many children grow up with too much or too little. That's what Masoma said. And I think that's so true because if you're too poor, all you can think about is surviving. And if the student that when I was raising my kids, it was just distressing because of the number of children in the US who either grow up with too much or too little. And the middle class is shrinking. And children really believe that their parents give them a standard of life where they really grow up thinking they can't be good parents unless they have that standard of life. They, they have to give that to their kids and they're, you know, they're destroying the earth and they're destroying, you know, their societies by creating a uh, entrenched wealthy class. But they, they got their survival instinct connected to all these unnecessary goods. And it is really scary. <laughs> um, anyway. You know, Aristotle tells you, and he tells you why you shouldn't do this. He tells you why you should raise your kids to be middle class, whatever middle class is, or to be middle class if you can, if you can, and to be happy being middle class. And middle class in Bangladesh is different than middle class in the U.S., but um, just learning how not to make class an issue, not to make it something kids are aware of. Kids just want to play. They don't want to be self-conscious about being too poor or too rich or having material things that other kids don't have. That, like that's very unnatural for a child. And it should be intuitively obvious. And yet, you know, people just violate these basic principles, the golden rule. It's incredible. And then the same with courage. Children can easily get messed up and have be afraid of too much or not enough and parents you know it should be common sense but really it's not human beings really have to think about courage and dangers all the time i mean it is amazing how difficult it is for us <laughs> to just do the basic stuff and how easily we go to an extreme um, and that's because we have the self-conscious awareness and this power of choice. Um, okay, and then generosity. And so this is where I've talked about this stuff a lot. That's why I said this is an easy part to read, is that now I just, in prose, I write it for you. And so hopefully, you know, you'd be able to understand um, that pretty easily and how it all fits together. So my, my point here is to say it does all fit together into this, the mind is a microcosm in the macrocosm. And, and your wisdom is this desire for your idea of truth to actually correspond to what's out there. Um, and the, you know, the final punchline is that that's what systems thinking is. That's where Laszlo and Davies and Whitehead, people who know quantum physics and have come up with ideas about what that means for the human mind, for how we should live, and ideas drive us, is their conclusion. The whole is greater than the sum of the parts. 
and then the the systems, the holes that are based on our idea of the good is a bigger hole than the other things, right? Um, okay. And then pure science as opposed to um, um, practical wisdom. And then his idea of God, which is also very generic in its energy and it fits in with Hindu and Buddhist and Muslim and Christian and it even hit, uh, fits in with humanism, really. Um, let's see. So then I go back and compare it to Davies and Laszlo and all that stuff. Um, okay. The system science is leading to conclusions that are perfectly consistent with the most universal ideas for how to live embedded in the great religions and using Aristotle's view of God and the good life can lead to insights and our ability to um, separate universal values from particular idiosyncrasies. So that, that's kind of the punchline of this paper in the United Nations and stuff like that. So, um, all right, then let's see. I was going to ask each of you to have a response. And while you're thinking of how you're going to respond, let me explain what we're doing for the rest of the, the rest, the next three classes. So we have a Sunday, no, yeah, Sunday, Tuesday, and then Sunday. And then the following week is final week. So we're going to read a neuroscientist who also has thrown out the blank slate and dualism, the enlightenment. He says, it's all been proven through empirical data that those are wrong. And then he says, actually, what's been proven through neuroscience is that thought causes thought. Oh, really? <laughs> like, Really? You're reinventing the wheel. Um, okay. Yeah, go ahead, Ashlyn. That's fine. Um, so he thinks this is a new idea, which is sad. <laughs> um, and he had he's very popular. Three Nobel Prize winners just rave about his books, right? All these scientists, which just shows you they, their, their original education was very one-sided and very biased. And so these other, you know, it's just now occurring to them. So what does that tell you about the educational system? And what does that tell you about your own education as a liberal arts school when you have this weirdo teacher who's bringing back in Aristotle and you think she's totally crazy and then all of a sudden, oh, it's trendy. <laughs> and then you're, you know, you might talk to your other friends at college and they're still, you know, in some old paradigm or they just do science. They don't think about stuff. And you're just going, oh my gosh, like what's going on? But anyway, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about his, what he said about Spinoza, he, he was advocating Spinoza's idea of the intellectual love of God. He's bringing back institutional religion. He's saying, oh, you know, it really isn't all wrong. It's got a lot of ideas. Like, oh. Okay, Mr. Damasio, you're the first person to know this. He's so full of himself, he drives me nuts. But anyway, and then he said some other stuff I think is outrageous and self-important and he has a lot of the blindnesses that people trained in the sciences have, right? So we've talked about how feminists in the West go to these developing countries and they have blindnesses, gender-based blindnesses, right? Now, the last one is we're gonna talk about this science-based blindness. And um, I'm using the archetype of the god Apollo, the god, the god of reason. And Mr. Damasio is an absolutely classic 
example of the god of reason. And Apollo in Greek mythology was emotionally immature. He chased nymphs in his spare time, right? He chased female, young females he had no respect for, right? And then, and they, they rejected him and then he took revenge on them. He was really nasty emotionally, really immature. And then um, he was indifferent to justice. Like he was on the side in the war. One of the, one of the sides in this war was clearly had a just cause and the other one clearly was wrong. So he was on the side with the just cause, but they started fighting within themselves. They were very inefficient. And the other side was very unified. And so he just changed sides because he likes, he likes a system that works. So he is a classic case of a CEO of a company that runs a really good company. It's very efficient. He provides jobs, he makes money. He's just really a good business person. And he, he divorces his wives and marries a younger model every 10 to 15 years and starts a new family, right? And, and the world is being run by these Apollonian guys. Um, so, so I think it's important because all of the things he is blind about are things that are making the world a worse place. Um, we worship reason still. And then we pit it, and then we, I mean, we have all the problems, and he thinks he's solving the problems, and he's not. So I think, and then neuroscience is very, very popular among psychologists. Um, there's lots of branches of neuroscience, and um, Mr. Um, Zuckerman, Mark Zuckerman and his wife, who's a doctor, they gave billions of their fortune to neuroscience. And, uh, you know, I mean, you can study the brain and you can study, you know, these pills, developing drugs. Yeah, Mr. Damasio, just to get, just to get you going about why I think it's important. He said he's part of the, his neuroscience is behind the development of these drugs for depression and pain, pain drugs, depression drugs, um, violence. Uh, and he said in 2003, okay, we're almost, he said 20 years from now, we will have changed the human playing field. We will cure humanity forever of depression, addiction, violence, and pain. Oh, really, Mr. Damasio? I mean, isn't that crazy? He really, but that's the kind of blindness, right? He's going to save the world with reason, right? What do we get? We get tens of thousands of Americans dying of opioid overdoses, right? And the thing about Mr. Anybody trained in the Greeks would know immediately that that's what's going to happen unless you do something about it. So that's what I want to get at you. These, these weirdo Greek gods and goddesses, you know, they're not so weird. <laughs> There's actually something to all this. So that's what I, I kind of want to get. Um, get you to understand because there's so many people who are so blind and ignorant and so caught up in their specializations. Um, all right, so I am just going to call on whoever's left, and you can pass if you like, but if you have some reaction to what I've said, and then I'll let you go, okay? Um, Amal, do you have a reaction to anything that I said? Um, just a second. Uh, yeah, uh, I just uh, like I like the uh, idea that you included uh, the cognitive sciences and neurosciences, and like it shows that our brain is just not only like a machine because like our thoughts bring other thoughts, and that's 
that's what shape uh, you know our free will and uh, personhood because like we gotta understand that it's like um like it's a it's like outside our um mind and uh, yeah uh, like because it's like it's identity and as i said like um the if we don't have memories and um like, like we don't have identity right because it will just like it, it will just be only a, a you know instant instant awareness if i can call it that, that way uh yeah so that's my reaction okay so this is so the the class sort of culminates in why this is philosophical psychology right because it's based on this thoughts cause thoughts right and that's that's philosophy right and so it's just the class is sort of culminating in this is the recent trendy thing, right? And philosophers have been saying this forever. Um, or the discipline of philosophy is based on that. And then philosophers have been denying it forever. <laughs> but um, so uh, there was something else I was going to say, but I can't remember. Anyway, yeah, as long as you get that, that that's kind of where the, the class is going. Oh, in this particular COVID moment, you really, life is asking you to really think about your thinking, right? It's really asking a lot of you in terms of to strengthen your mind. But at least you know you have a mind and it can be strong. And, and that's uh, what I'm asking you to do is for your sake. <laughs> but it's possible and it's good and um, it's there and you don't have to think you're crazy. And um, then you can start creating your life, right, in a very deliberate way. And I hope you have friends. Friends help a lot. Um, Isabel, um, do you have any reaction to what I've said about it? Yes. Okay. Am I audible? Yes. Ah, okay, thank you. So uh, regarding what you have said, especially you mentioned about if we are too poor, we all, we all can only think about um, to survive. So this is true. Like if we are poor, then we we don't have, uh, we are not going to think or going higher than that. For example, like poor people, what they want is they only uh, want to find ways on how to get the food to eat. And the family will never like, uh, support the children to go to school to go higher than what they wish or what human beings have to do like they cannot be flourish because of uh being too poor so i think it is really uh important for people to especially knowing how to adapt the situation especially work on really hard for that and also it also depends on how people um um, choose to live their lives. For example, even if you are poor, but if you find ways on how to um, get rid of uh, this life, I mean, uh, to get rid of a being poor, for example, you find a way on how to get a job. So then when you have a job, you will, you know how to manage well, then you can, of course, support your uh, children or your family to to get the education and to achieve whatever you want in your life. Even if you are uh, poor, but you are getting a job and supporting your children, of course, the poor is only be with you, not your children or the future that they're going to come. So this is what I'm going to say. Right. For a lot of people, their idea of the good is that your children would have a better life than you had, right? Um, yes. So again, that an, a, a monkey wouldn't be, I don't know, maybe monkeys act that way, but I don't think they do it self-consciously. And they don't do it as a matter of choice, right? I can choose not to do this, right? They do it. Exactly. Yeah, okay. Um, Masoma, do you have anything? Uh, yes, Professor. Uh, professor, I, I really like the idea that, you know, of uh, uh, yeah, like you are agreeing with Aristotle that, you know, if we uh, sit, uh, you know, uh, 
a right goal for ourselves to achieve, then uh, then it would, I mean, all the means that we are doing for achieving those end would be, you know, right. But then uh, uh, the opposite also is the same. So if, if I choose a goal, uh, I mean, an end goal for my life. So if I say that, okay, I will work on my, you know, to get famous or to get honor, but then all the means that I am using to get this honor or, you know, being famous uh, can be corrupted, can, you know, can be wrong. Even, uh, so let's say an example. So if some people are, you know, want to get rich, uh, and then they are like, even they are going to, you know, hire, uh, like, uh, they, they want to get higher educations just for the purpose of getting money. Uh, but then, yeah, it would be wrong because I don't think so they will get the right education because their goal and the end aim is wrong. And I see this a lot in my society, especially in the uh, education sector, that people are just, I, previously I also mentioned this, you know, that even in my society, even some of my professors and the university professors thinks that way. And then they are not, you know, they are not focusing on the critical thinking or reasoning, but they are focusing on only on the memory of the students. The exams are meant like that way. The questions are meant that way. And even in the in my high school, I, I remember that the student was memorizing uh, like the books. Those who have very good memories, they got very high marks, and the purpose was only just to get good marks and a good grade and a, and a good paper. Uh, but then, yeah, no one was thinking that way that this is helping uh, really in my life. Uh, that's why they were thinking, you know, education is not that important. It's just you know. Uh, you have to do this because uh, like you know to get uh, rich or to find a good job but then uh, when it comes that way that they use is practically in their life uh, like there is no usage because they don't know nothing uh, and yeah. okay yeah there's i think a difference. I also... there's a difference yes. yeah that's true Amal. um there's a difference between knowledge and wisdom um but the other thing is that you, I mean, nothing I can teach you is going to get you anywhere near a job, right? So I think I work with, right, the people who teach you subjects that'll get you a job. Um, but they're teaching them at AUW. They could make more money teaching them somewhere else. So they really do care about you. And we really have to work together right? Because I can't help you get a job, but some other teacher can, but they can't help you get wiser, right? <laughs> they just have to teach you probability and statistics or something, right? And so it really, again, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, right? So liberal ed is set up so that you're exposed to all these disciplines, but it, to me, my class is about how you figure out how they all fit together. Um, but the other thing about seeking money or power is that you end up having friendship bonds. I mean, the people you're connected to and the people you depend on aren't nice people, right? They don't follow the golden rule. They're competing against you for money and power. So if that, you know, I don't think I just, I don't think it's a happy life, right? Because you're never rich enough. You're never powerful enough. The people around you are all, out, you know. I'm not a competitive person, but I do think that if you seek, you know, if you try to live a high quality of life, you also end up connecting with people who are also trying that. And they are all over the place. Uh, my students often talk about the teachers they've had or the NGO leaders that they've had, or, you know, there's so many people out there. And um, I don't know. I just think it's a higher quality of life. I don't see why anybody wouldn't want it I don't get it but I'm a preacher's kid so I think I'm pretty hopeless anyway um so now what did is there anything I said that you wanted to comment on uh yeah professor only the last part so I think you know people uh maybe not people people are not choosing the higher pleasure maybe you know because 
because of the culture, <laughs> because of the norms that are, you know, I mean, culture is very, very powerful, Professor. I mean, if you are born in a society like Mel was saying that if you are not born in a right situation or in a right condition, you might also go that way that other peoples are going. Maybe even if you understand that this is not a right way, you might not have the right situation for, you know, seeking higher pleasure. But then, yeah, I was thinking this, that, you know, maybe professors things, I mean, I don't want to generalize yet. There are, there are uh, like exactly good people uh, that understand these things. And uh, uh, so not everyone is uh, seeking like, or thinking this way. So yeah, professor, I think sometimes the matter of the culture and then how we brought up. So, okay. Yeah. And then, you know, the other thing is whatever is true of other people, AUW set up, to have a culture, you know, of students, that, uh, people that support each other, and they have a goal, and they are trying to create a new culture. So you're not, you can be outside of the normal box, and you're still in the AUW box, right? Um, so that's, you know, you have uh, an opportunity. So the other thing I, again, want to emphasize that you always support each other. Um, now, do you have something? Are you there? Uh, yeah, Professor Atik, nope. Did you say? No. Nope. No, okay. Um, now writes a lot about um, Myanmar. It's great. I really like reading about it. Uh, it's distressing, but I sure like finding out about that. Um, Ritika, do you have? A comment at all? What strikes, yeah, her mind is that um, information is a concept, right? Yeah, because it never speaks for itself, right? Our minds are always processing the information according to our ideas, right? It doesn't order itself. We order it. Um, and you can tell that by how people process. Um, for I mean, the thing that struck me today is I found out 60% of Americans really think crime is a big issue. So the Republican Party has capitalized crime, you know, my God, we had this president for four years that did everything possible to pit people against each other. We've studied how Black Lives Matter, how Black people have been put into these ghettos and how crime is really socially constructed. And we have to create better housing. I mean, unbelievable. Um, but they're just choosing to go this really low level of society. and. So the information, right? They're processing information in a way that just is so different from the way I process the information about my country. So, you know, it really matters how you use your mind, how you decide to make sense out of things in terms of the bigger concepts of what are the real causes of crime injustice you know uh so so that's i agree with you and the more you could realize that is that we really live in a world of concepts we live in a world of culture and um a police officer killing a black man is not just a, a data point <laughs> it's got to be understood in this huge context um or you're not going to, if you don't understand the causes, you're not going to be able to fix it. And the causes have a lot to do with history and racism and all that. It's not because African American men are more aggressive. Okay. Mosa, what have you got? I'm going to say I don't have reaction. I'm just listening. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, main takeaway is that. We live in an information age, but we live in a mind age, right? Just like every age, every human age is driven by 
the minds of the people, which is their ideas of good, evil, justice, injustice. So you can say things like fear is driving people. And I, I say, no, it's their ideas about fear. It's their ideas about their feelings. It's their ideas about the causes and how to fix it. That's what's driving people, not the fear itself. We always process stuff. We always bring it into this realm of culture. And, um, and so then we always have to examine the, our ideas, our minds. And that's, that's what I want to leave you with. And, I, and that's where the, where the um, class is going in. It's going to end up with a very popular view of the psyche that's the basis for a whole lot of drugs um, that people give you know therapies that use drugs and um, Mr. Damasio has this theory that mind is important but then he says yeah but drugs will fix everything <laughs> if mind is important drugs won't fix everything he doesn't understand that um, but anyway that's the trailer, right? That's, that's the teaser. Is that what they call it? Where are you going to read it? I'll send it to you in a day or two. Okay, goodbye. Bye, Bye my professor. professor. See you tomorrow.